Καλησπέρα σας και πάλι. Καλώς ήλθατε στο τρίτο μέρος αυτής της συζήτησης. Μιλάμε σήμερα για τη γλώσσα μας, για τα αρχαία ελληνικά, την αρχή της γλώσσας μας. Στο προηγούμενο, στην προηγούμενη συζήτηση μιλήσαμε για τις μεθόδους διδασκαλίας, για το πώς δηλαδή κάποιος μπορεί να διδαχτεί και να μάθει καλά τα αρχαία ελληνικά, χρησιμοποιώντας τη ζωντανή μέθοδο διδασκαλίας. Μπαίνοντας μέσα στην τάξη να ξεκινήσει ο καθηγητής να του μιλάει κατευθείαν στα αρχαία ελληνικά. Και ξέρετε για εμάς που έχουμε το παρελθόν των νέων ελληνικών, έχουμε αυτή τη βάση, τη γερή των νέων ελληνικών, το να μπει κάποιο μέσα και να μας πει χαίρε ή χαίρετε, δεν μας ακούγεται καθόλου ξένο. Και όμως τα αρχαία ελληνικά μπορεί να διδαχτούν με αυτόν τον τρόπο και έτσι πιστεύω ότι μέχρι το τέλος της συζήτησης αυτής θα σας έχουμε πείσει και για αυτό. Στο τελευταίο μας μέρος εδώ στην πανέμορφη αυτή αίθουσα από το Delphi Economic Forum που μας φιλοξενεί και ευχαριστούμε πάρα πάρα πολύ. Θα ήθελα εδώ να κάνω μια παρένθεση. Είμαι πραγματικά ευγνώμων στο Οικονομικό Φόρουμ των Δελφών που δέχτηκε να παραχωρήσει μια αίθουσα και τόση πολλή ώρα για ένα τέτοιο θέμα το οποίο δεν άφτεται της πολιτικής ή της οικονομίας αλλά της παιδείας και του πολιτισμού. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και τη Language Cert που μας δίνει την ευκαιρία να προσκαλούμε και να φέρνουμε όλους αυτούς τους καθηγητές στην Ελλάδα και να μπορείτε εσείς να τους δείτε όλους συγκεντρωμένους. So thank you so much for being here for this last part. Όπου βρίσκεστε εδώ. I would like to you people that have taught, know and have taught ancient Greek, but they also run or they are in charge of programs, special programs regarding classical Greek. I would like to start with uh, Ignazio Armella. You're in charge of this beautiful program at the Vivarium Novum Academy. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank Professor you. Stephen Hunt, who has been teaching Latin and ancient Greek for many, many years and is now at the Department of Education in Cambridge, writing books and promoting Greek the best way possible. Thank you for being here. It's our pleasure and honor to have you. Thank you. Christophe Rico from uh, the Polis uh, Jerusalem Institute. Um, thank you so much for being with us. You have been teaching ancient Greek for how long? Oh, for, I think for 30 years already. 30 years now, yeah. and you will speak to us about the method and the books that you use. And uh, Marco Romani, representing the Pedia Institute from New York, the, the <coughs> Italian branch of uh, Pedia Institute in New York. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, Marco, I will, I will start with you. What is your background in the classics, and what is the, ba the background of your institution? Right, so um, starting with me personally, uh, my background in classics um, is as a historian of science in antiquity. Um, so I have a PhD from Harvard University um, at which I uh, completed a dis dissertation on the idea of scientific discovery in classical antiquity. So I'm particularly interested in the uh, connection between um, the ancient Greek world and the development of, uh, of what we call science. Um, what the, about the Pythia Institute? The Paideia Institute uh, was founded just over 10 years ago um, in New York and Rome, actually, uh, simultaneously, to uh, promote the learning and teaching of classical languages via primarily student travel. Um, so we, at Paideia, we like bringing uh, students to Greece and Italy and other parts of Europe to introduce them to um, the classical languages in the places in which they were born and spoken. Why is this important? Why is it traveling and bringing students to the place where all these beautiful things were born that you said before? Why is it so important? Why can't they just sit, stay in New York and learn about this? Well, to put it very briefly, because it really makes things click. Mm -hmm. um, when students who often have never been abroad or sometimes they've never left their hometown or states, um, for the first time in their lives they see the Acropolis, you know, the Parthenon or, you know, the beautiful Temple of Apollo here in Delphi or the Colosseum and the Forum in Rome, um, it really brings the ancient world to life, uh, to life for them and they really start 
um, seeing the connection between the texts they read, the languages they learn to speak and read, um, and concrete life, concrete lived so experience. So it's an inspiration to them. Exactly. It brings the, the spirit out mm -hmm. of the language. So uh, you, Ignazio, tell us a little bit about the Vivarium Novum Academy in Italy. Uh, what are you specialized in? And uh, what kind of students do you accept at the Academy? Okay, so uh, as for myself, I am uh, Mexican. I have been in the uh, Academia Vivarium Novum for some uh, years already. And uh, I study classics in uh, both Mexico and Italy. And I teach in the Academia Vivarium Novum both uh, uh, philosophy, ancient philosophy, and uh, also Latin composition. The Academia Vivarium Novum has a long story, but uh, long story short, as they say. Uh, right now, as this exists today, it's an international school for the humanities, for the classical humanities. We have people coming from all over the world. We have uh, people coming from uh, America, North America, from uh, South America, from uh, Europe, of course, also from uh, even uh, India, China, uh, from Nepal, we have students. And they are all together. Uh, they live in a sort of uh, college uh, environment. Uh, they are sort of a large family. And uh, they are gathered by their passion for the humanities, for classical humanities. And what is the only rule that you have in the academy? <laughs> the main rule is that they have to speak in Latin, or if uh, they are not able to do it, also in Greek. Uh, they can. So the only rule in the academy is for everybody to speak Latin and ancient Greek exclusively. Yes. exclusively. So if they don't know uh, how to say something and they they really want to say it and they don't know how to, especially in the first few days. What do they do? Do they imitate? What, what do they do? Yes, uh, they, they have to, they are, the necessity will drive them to. We, we say, uh, like, uh, just uh, kidding with them that uh, if they don't learn how to say dos, mo, dos mojidor, they will die of thirst in the first day, <laughs> so they will have to learn it. And yes, it's the environment that makes this, uh, that creates this possibility to have these two languages, classical languages, as uh, their own languages. And uh, the beautiful thing is that uh, all these students are bounded by these languages. These mm -hmm. are languages w which are not of particularly any one of them, but at the same time, they are all, all of them. Stephen, tell us, why are you so interested in the living language method? You have edited, written and published books. You're publishing magazines, journals about the active language teaching. Why are you so interested in the specific method of teaching? I think the thing about the, uh, what we might describe as active Latin or active Greek teaching is that it, it excites all the senses of the student. That promotes great engagement and motivation to want to carry on. It's also, I think, a way in for everybody. Um, as, as you said, gesture is a starting place for learning a language. It's not take gestures out and look at words. It's about using language with what other, other forms of communication we have to actually get to grips with the language. And you start off very small. You start off with simple things about yourself and about things that you do around you. Because it's not just about having the words and the actions, it's also about having something to do with those words and actions. If you're staring at them on the page, it's kind of like pleasing the teacher. And we like our teachers, of course, but that's, that's as far as it goes. So in a sense, the audience is yourself and your colleagues, and there's a reason for doing something. I think that's the most important thing. I think we've lost that mm -hmm. over the last 100 years or so, partly in the UK because Latin and Greek became part of an examination system, which was not really about learning the language for communication. It was learning about how languages worked for the process of getting into certain sorts of university. I have to say, including mine. Um, and I think we've passed that now, and we're finding that there are, we're, we're going back, as you said, as you said, back to the past to find out ways that actually made people, everybody, learn language. I mean, Reginald Foster, who I'm sure we're all very familiar with, you know, he said, I, I won't use the words because we're on television, but he said, you know, the, the basest people in Rome could speak Latin, the basest people in Greece could speak Greek. We've just made it too hard for the people of the 20th century. And I think so that's we're, it. we're not stupid, it's just very hard. Um, I don't, we make it harder. We make it harder than we need to. Um, and I think 
certainly in the UK we've made it too difficult for kids to want to progress because it's been bound up with an examination system. But I do a huge amount of travelling, as I'm sure yes. you noticed. Um, I was in Australia a couple of weeks ago and I've been in America quite a few times. One day maybe I'll find my way to the Polis Institute. And what I see there is this real turn in pedagogy for the classical languages. And what we're trying to persuade is governments and oh, examination yes. assessment boards to match what's going on on the ground in classrooms today. Do they listen to you? Slowly, yes. I mean, I, we're here at the, at, at the guide of a particular organisation um, and I'm, they obviously are very, very interested in ways of measuring students' proficiency in how they use language. So rather than testing them against a pre-arranged set of rules, oh, you can't do that, never mind, you get a low grade. It's actually saying, what can you do with the language? How are you using the language? And I think that's the way forward. I think that's a number of examination boards are trying that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very good. Um, Christoph, tell us a little bit about the Polis uh, Institute, about the method that you use there. You're also promoting the active language method. Uh, that is, people come to the class and without knowing Greek, you start talking to them in ancient Greek right away. Perfect. Please yeah. tell us how you do this and which books do you use? Okay, there are many things in your questions. <laughs> uh, first of all, to, well, the way it is true that when students arrive, when they come for the first time, they don't know anything in Greek. And as it is done in many other institutions, we just start speaking Greek as uh, when English is taught, it, it is in this, the same I, way. I, I love this approach. We, ju we just start speaking in Greek. Well, I mean, imagine if this could happen in Greek schools or Greek universities. Oh, Christophoros, ti onomasoi. Ti onomasoi. Ti And so on. I mean, so, uh, and there are techniques for that. So, uh, you don't, so there are techniques. First of all, it's very important, the progressivity. So there are things that have been taught to, to be taught first and things that have to be taught afterwards. Uh, for instance, um, it's very interesting to see how a child learns his or her own mother tongue. Mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, imperatives are very important right from the very beginning. Or the ictics, what's this, what's that? And if you follow these, uh, these elements, um, it really uh, is very effective. So uh, what, we, what we notice is the effectiveness, uh, the, 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 the rapidity with which people learn the language and start speaking. Tell us about the books that you use. The, yeah. Some of them you have written the books that, that, that are being taught at the Polis Institute. But so, also tell us a little bit about the children's books that you have translated oh. in ancient Greek. I read, I recently read Hansel and Gretel in yeah. ancient Greek. How beautiful is that and why do you do it? Okay, so I will start with Hansel and Gretel and then I will talk about the, 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 the books. Uh, Hansel and Gretel, so the idea was to give comprehensible input to the students. There are not many texts that are easy to read and there are, that are accessible for someone who has followed uh, 120 hours of uh, classes. Mm -hmm. Because basically the idea is to start reading Hansel and Gretel, understanding everything, which is very rewarding for a, for a, for a learner. I mean, you, you have only 120 hours of uh, uh, Greek learning and you can already read Hansel and Gretel because you have all the new words that are in the margins mm -hmm. So that is extremely extremely rewarding yes. And if you read something that you understand something that is very simple, but that you understand you want to learn more I mean, mm -hmm. it's a uh, uh, it's extremely important to reward the learner and it creates motivation absolutely. for the students uh, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. So then the, uh, the other part of your question was about uh, the method. So uh, um, I have uh, written uh, the Polis uh, book, Polis, uh, speaking uh, ancient Greek as a living language. The idea is to have a, a book. Lalin, the kini dialecto tizosi. Malista. So uh, the idea is to to have a book that teaches you not only to read Greek, but also to speak. And first you need to speak in order to be able to read faster. 
So uh, that book has been already published uh, uh, like uh, eight years ago. And now we are about to publish Polis 2. So the second volume of uh, the Polis uh, method will be published. Uh, uh, I, I mean, it's already almost finished, so it, will, it should be uh, within the, f the, the very few months coming. It will be it will be available. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, what other tools, motivational tools, do you use at the VIA Institute, uh, except from traveling? And do you think that by certifying classical Greek gives motivation to the children to learn more? Right. I think so. I'll start from the very end of your question. Uh, I think it will because it has been mentioned in the, in the previous panel. Um, Offering certification for an ancient language such as classical Greek um, gives it, in a way, uh, the same uh, status, let's say, or the same legitimacy that we have in um, the teaching of modern languages. Mm -hmm. Because you know we're all used to the idea of having certifications for English, French, German, mm -hmm. and so on. You know, if you want to enroll in a degree program in an English-speaking country, you need to have an English language certification, and so on. So I think that that will uh, sort of put ancient Greek on the map, so mm -hmm. to speak, from that from that point of view. Um, at the Paide Institute, um, part of the way in which we like to motivate students is by offering self-paced <coughs> curricula. Mm -hmm. uh, so in addition to our um, travel programs, uh, which we've already talked about, um, we also have um, digital teaching tools, uh, curricula that we publish uh, online through our um, learning management platform uh, that essentially allow each student and each class of students with their teachers to learn at their own pace um, and sort of go through um, materials such as um, written texts or... So you're trying uh, to make it as yeah. easy as possible? As easy as possible, as fun as possible, as active as possible. This is, uh, sure. this is uh, the main thing. Yes. Um, and how about you, Iñatsu, at the academy, um, would you think that certifying classical Greek would constitute a motivational tool for your students? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, because uh, uh, Cicero, quoting uh, Plato, says that uh, honors alit artes. That is, uh, we need the timi, we need the honor in order to uh, raise awareness uh, of a subject uh, and also to make uh, people uh, understand that, that uh, there's a status, as Marco was saying. So a certification, uh, it's uh, absolutely uh, something that uh, must be done and uh, we are very happy that it's been, it, it's been, there are people working on it right now mm -hmm. because uh, it, it makes uh, it possible for young students to understand that uh, ancient Greek can have the same status as, as other modern languages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how about you, Stephen? Tell us a little bit about your opinion on certifying classical Greek. Um, we all know that certification of exam certification through examinations is a motivating factor for most people. Um, we have to get the sweet spot between giving them something which they can do and giving them something which is not too hard. Mm -hmm. Because we want to, and I think one of the things we need to think about is how we measure success at different points in a student's career or a learner's career or whatever it might be. Um, I think um, we're on the cusp at the moment of some very interesting work done with digital assessment. Mm -hmm. And there are two aspects that I think are really important. First of all, with digital assessment, we have to be careful that we don't assess the wrong things just because it's easy for digital assessment to do it. But the good thing about digital assessment is that it can follow the student's progress much better. Mm -hmm. We have, for example, in the UK a number of course books used where students do their work and the computer takes the, takes the trouble out of the teacher by marking it for them. But I'm thinking more along the lines of something which is more adaptive to students' proficiency. And so when a student is able to do a particular task, the computer notches up a bit further and says, can you do this one then? And then if they can't, it goes back down again. This is, this is exactly the reason why Language Cert has issued four levels of certification, A1, A2, B1, and recently B2, so uh, that the student are, is motivated to learn slowly and upgrade their knowledge as time goes by. It is very much, it's so much fun for children. It's uh, with the pictures, colored picture, mix and match, fill in the gaps, multiple choice. So it's something really familiar 
compared to that? I think that's absolutely right, and I think it moves. It, it, it starts off very much like like a modern language. We talked earlier on about how we use gesture and tone of voice and images and pictures and things like that. And we can assess students' knowledge not of the language through pictures, but as the pictures as support for the language. But then you can take the pictures away and just leave them with the language. Mm -hmm. And I think that means to say then that some students may never get further than that, and others may progress. But what happens is that we need to think what are the potentials of digital assessment for helping all of our students, not just the really brainy ones. Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. all of our students, I think everybody on our panels today has been about making classical languages, particularly Greek, available to everybody, whether they're little ones or big ones. Yes. And, and not turning is, people away. That is a big progress. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned before something about trying to convince the government to change the curriculum, to move forward. Do you think that this is really possible? Do you think that we can do this? I think we can, yes. Um, I think what I saw at a conference only, uh, only last weekend was that in Greece there's a change in the curriculum for ancient Greek, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell, at uh, lower intermediate level. Um, uh, in uh, the UK, we're already working on new qualifications, which will come into place in the future, maybe five, six years' time. Um, and this is from the ground up. It's from teachers who know their classes and know their students and are dedicated to wanting to make Latin and ancient Greek available to more people. We can't keep on saying it's only for the best and the brightest and the ones who can survive. We've got to make it available to all. And we are working with, at the moment, the examination boards, look at the International Baccalaureate, for example, um, which I had a little part in, trying to make things a little bit more accessible by giving students an opportunity to be creative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of what you do, for example, is uh, with, with smaller children is incredibly creative. It's music, it's dance, it's performance. And that's what, that's what ancient Greek is about, isn't it? Yes. Here we are in Delphi. Yes. There's a great big theatre down the road. And yet we take it out of the, no, 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 we must just look at words mm -hmm. on a page. I couldn't Dead agree ones. more. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with us today here in Delphi. Thank you so much for watching us. Thank you so much for being here.